Okay, if I could uh, invite you to find your seats. If I could invite you to find your seats uh, for the, the grand finale, a debate that we have uh, a great organization uh, here. We have um, a debate we run as a tradition at the end of each of uh, the Techna uh, events. And this year's debate is uh, society is not ready for AI in healthcare today or now. And uh, so I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Rossos. Uh, Dr. Peter Rossos is the Chief Medical Informatics Officer, University Health Network, uh, a professor uh, in the, and, a, and a gastroenterologist in, in uh, uh, University of Toronto and a University Health Network. It's a fantastic individual to work with. I work very closely with Peter as our Chief Medical Information Officer, and he helps us guide uh, bringing new technologies and digital technologies in particular into the hospital. So I will invite Dr. Rossos and he can invite the panel up uh, and the debaters. Dr. Rossos. Well, thanks for the uh, very kind introduction this afternoon, David. And it's uh, a real privilege putting together an all-star debate team here. Um, and what I'd like to do is just to sort of roll in on all the great momentum that's been built up today. I just introduce you uh, to the folks that'll be here this afternoon and debating. And we will be registering your opinions, uh, not only in terms of commentary, but numerically to see how they're doing. So pay attention and uh, be ready to score. So our, our first uh, sort of presentation for the pro uh, to the question will be uh, Dr. Mohamed Mandanami, who's known to many of us around here. He's actually the founding director of the Lee Kai Shing Center for Healthcare Analytics and Research uh, and Training, just down the street at St. Michael's Hospital here in uh, Toronto. He's a professor uh, in uh, Department of Medicine uh, at the Leslie Dan uh, Faculty of Pharmacy and also with, within the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation. He's also an adjunct uh, senior scientist at ISIS, and that's our Institute for Clinical Evaluative uh, Sciences. Now, before uh, joining Li Kaixing, and I, I didn't know that until I, I had a look at the bio, was Mohammed was actually in the private sector uh, as Director of Outcomes Research at FIVO, uh, Pfizer, uh, the global uh, pharmaceuticals uh, branch in New York. So very interesting uh, background. And his research interests are fairly broad. They include uh, pharmacoepidemiology, pharmacogenomics, uh, drug policy. Uh, despite his youth, he's published over 450 papers here. So uh, someone that doesn't sleep and looks very, very good. So congratulations, Mohammed. We look forward to hearing from you. Now, uh, on the topic of resilience, uh, Rich Karuna, who I'll just introduce briefly, because I think most of the folks here were, were uh, also here in the morning. And so we flew him in from Seattle. We kept him up late last night. We kept pouring drinks. We had him give the keynote. And now he's closing with the debate this afternoon. And so for those of you that didn't have, now that's resilience, right? <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, so as we know, uh, Rich is a leading uh, researcher at uh, Microsoft. He's been on uh, faculty and academia at a number of uh, world-leading organizations, including uh, Cornell, UCLA, and uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he's still in his current role, uh, taking on various students of uh, multiple disciplines and various levels of, of training and enjoys that very much. Uh, his current focus is on learning for medical decision making, as some of you saw uh, this morning, uh, intelligible modeling, which I, I think is a great term, deep learning, and computational ecology, which is a, uh, uh, a new term for me, so thank you for that. And then I'll introduce um, Marzia Ghassami. Now, she's also here at U of T as an assistant professor uh, in uh, computer science, uh, and she's affiliated with the Vector Institute. She had a PhD at MIT, and uh, that was focused on creating and applying machine uh, learning algorithms, and that included work at Beth uh, Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Mass General in Boston. So uh, terrific work, and we're 
very, very pleased to have her here with us at the University of Toronto. And uh, prior to that, uh, she had a, a Master's of Science degree in Biomedical Engineering from Oxford as a Marshall Scholar, and uh, Computer Science and Electrical Engineering in New Mexico State University. So another very youthful and accomplished person. So uh, there you go, including you, of course, uh, Rich. Okay. <laughs> so uh, here's, the, uh, here's the layout of the afternoon, and that is, uh, because Mohammed has just joined us this afternoon, we thought we'd give him 20 minutes to present the pro side of whether AI is ready for prime time. Then Rich will have 10 minutes, because remember, he had the keynote this morning. But then Mohammed will have five minutes in terms of a counter. And then Rich, five minutes. And then you will do your post-debate voting. And then we'll hand over uh, to Marzier to sort of summarize this, bring this all together, and then welcome your feedback. Okay, so that's basically the outline for this session here. And once again, I'm, I'm very privileged to be able to introduce such an all-star debate team. And Mohammed, I'll just hand over uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. So it is my objective to convince you around the pro side of this argument. That's what I've been told. AI and healthcare, are we ready? So I'm going to start with some definitions. And I was told uh, I'm not allowed to use expletives. Um, I would just go ahead anyway, but then I was told security might get involved and my UFC days are over, so uh, I'm going to keep it clean. Why, yes, we are. <laughs> but is AI ready for us? Now, that's not the question. The question is, AI and healthcare, are we ready? So I'm going to go through some definitions. and I'm going to cheat a little bit. So I didn't give my slides in advance because I didn't want Rich to see them. <laughs> so some definitions. AI, from Encyclopedia Britannica, of course I'm not going to use a technical definition. AI is defined as the ability of a digital computer or computer-controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. Now remember these definitions because this is how you're going to vote. I'm going to confine it to these definitions. <laughs> we is defined as clinicians and hospital administrations. We can barely pronounce machine learning. Keep that in mind. Ready. Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Merriam-Webster suggests it's being ready, sorry, being ready is being prepared mentally or physically for some experience or action. Not necessarily doing it, being prepared. Collins Dictionary, to be ready to do something means to be about to do it or likely to do it. Again, keep these definitions in mind when you are voting. <laughs> this is how the debate is constrained, right? Great. A very simple argument. How many people can multiply 5,281 by 6,277 within two seconds? If you could do that, would you say you're intelligent? Probably, right? Yeah, this can do it. So by my definitions, we're already there. We've been there for many decades. This is artificial intelligence, just for sake of argument. So our problem in healthcare is a data-driven mindset is definitely there. We're all data-driven. We've been trained through all of our clinical training and programs and stuff to think evidence-based. But the problem is consistent evidence, there's consistent evidence of failure to translate research findings into clinical practice. Now, there's some statistics that are a bit dated, but more recent statistics are about the same here. 30 to 40% of patients do not get treatments of proven effectiveness. 20 to 25% of patients get care that is not needed or even potentially harmful. We've got a lot of room for improvement. So even small things can help us. And this is where I would argue AI could be extremely beneficial not to replace us, but to really help us narrow this gap. Now, are we ready? Well, there's an Intel survey of 200 US healthcare decision makers, which suggested that 91% of respondents believe AI will be used in clinical decision support. 84% of respondents believe companies who do not in invest in AI will, fit, will fall behind. 83% of respondents believe AI will improve the accuracy of medical diagnoses. And 37% of participants said they're already using AI. Now, if that's not being ready, I don't know what is. Are we preparing for AI in healthcare? We'll see all sorts of these uh, glamorous types of things in the media. 
AI beats doctors at cancer diagnoses, and some of these are pretty legitimate, I would say, and others, well, they're just glamorous. Uh, Self-taught AI beats doctors at predicting heart attacks. Your future doctor may not be human. This is the rise of, it, of AI medicine. Okay, I'm really milking it here, but you get my point, right? Examples of AI in action. There are things out there that are kind of, I don't know, interesting, I guess you could say. There's Babylon, for example, where you type in symptoms and it actually suggests what may be wrong and actually then links you up with a physician. A uh, similar type of concept with Sensely. These are like triage types of things that try and, and guesstimate and see uh, uh, where they can direct you. And I would argue that uh, my colleagues, my very worthy adversary, um, at Microsoft is also doing work in this space, clearly they believe in it, Project Inner Eye, Medical uh, Imaging AI to Empower Clinicians. And the quote here is from uh, the CEO of Cambridge University Hospitals and its ASPOT Foundation Trust that they value this relationship and they're actually actively doing it. Wonderful, we must be ready. Emerging data science centers in healthcare, we're actually investing in these centers these days, so if you look at Mass General and the Brigham at Harvard, they've established a clinical uh, center for clinical data science. UCSF, same thing. They have a center for this sort of work. University of Aberdeen, yep, they put some money in it too. And actually, my hospital, St. Michael's, we have as well. So we've established the Li Ka-Shing Center for Healthcare Analytics Research and Training. No one can ever remember that, so we just call it CHART. But basically what I'm saying here is that if we weren't ready, or we had no intent to go in this space, we wouldn't be spending time, resources, or energy really trying to get into this space, and, and I believe we are. We're very young, we're new, yes, but we see the reality that, that's taking full, or unfolding uh, before us, and, and the reality is we're ready, we're investing, we want to embrace this. I want to give you some examples of AI in action. I'm gonna be a bit self-promoting here. I think our, because uh, I know our stuff the best, uh, in that, the, uh, the types of projects that we have, I think you could classify as AI, and we're actually trying to put them into practice. The one thing I'll also say is that our structure is a little bit different. So um, one of the things you really need is a good data infrastructure to enable AI. And so we've actually had a multi-million dollar investment um, with a major corporation, I won't say who, okay, fine, IBM, um, who's worked with us uh, for the past few years to actually create a nice enterprise data warehouse on top of a pseudo data lake to enable us to do this sort of work. So you actually, you have to have that sort of infrastructure. And we have a team of data scientists that we brought in. Uh, now the rule with us is that our data scientists don't get to ask the questions. The questions have to come from the ground. So clinicians or hospital administrators are our two target audiences. We go through a whole process. Just because you have a question doesn't mean we take it on. You have to have sign off from your program director, medical director, your division and department head. So community has to buy in. We've also set up monthly meetings where we have four of our uh, senior vice presidents at the hospital the head of privacy risk, the head of decision support, and the head of uh, quality improvement, we meet monthly. Because if we do some projects and then we realize there's a quarter million dollar implementation cost, well, that's where we tend to get stuck. And if we have the buy-in from senior leadership, we know that it's gonna go through. So all of these things have to come to play to create that environment that makes us ready for AI. Otherwise, you'll have some people in the camp saying no, some people in the camp saying yes, and it's a bit of a mess. So all of that has happened to, able, to enable us to do this sort of work. So I'm gonna talk about ED volume prediction. So the concept here is fairly simple. At St. Michael's Hospital in their eMERGE, we see about 75,000, uh, we have about 75,000 encounters annually, and uh, we expect an increase of about 2% each year. And the wait times in the eMERGE can be very high, as everyone knows. Some days are worse than others. And being able to forecast days with high volumes can be helpful for staffing to ease wait times. And in our eMERGE, we are typically told, uh, you know, about two or three times a year, we get these massive surges that we just didn't expect, and it's just a mess in the eMERGE. Now, smaller surges that, that also end up being a little bit of a mess, it's not as bad, a few times a month. Um, so it's not huge, but it really does, does hurt us in terms of how we manage our patients. So the thought here is, could we actually predict how many patients we're gonna see in our eMERGE? So we developed a model that can forecast ED volumes at different granularities and forecast horizons in order to solve different administrative planning requirements. We forecast three days in advance. This is all driven by our end users. This is what they told us, uh, what they told us they wanted to see. So they basically said, I want like a weather forecast. Three days in advance, six hour intervals, how many people are gonna show up to our eMERGE? 
because then I can staff a bit better. But I also want one week, two weeks, four weeks, and three months in advance so I can have a little bit of a leeway in terms of planning. Do I have another nurse come in? Our uh, physicians have a little bit of flexibility around uh, the physician schedule so they can tweak that a bit as well. So our methods, well, we've uh, really incorporated time series type of approach. We've used a mixture of, of several different approaches, including ARIMA, state-based models, neural networks, and so forth. Our data sources, well, we use our data warehouse, but we've also scraped in weather data. So is there a snowstorm tomorrow night? Um, we're able to pull that in. A city planning data is something we played with as well. So are the Raptors playing at the ACC? Is there a marathon on Lakeshore Avenue? Uh, Lakeshore Boulevard, sorry. All of these things come into play and we're able to predict how many patients will come into our eMERGE. We were also told we want it broken down by uh, patient acuity, so by CTAS. Uh, we're also told that we want some sense of mental health patients um, because they're a uh, different kettle of fish in terms of managing them. So all these different parameters, again, are coming from our end users. So we explored all sorts of things like temperature, volume relationships, census, daily volume, and sure enough, there are some really striking patterns that just keep happening over and over again. So what have we done? Well, we've done forecasting models. We're able to predict volumes three days in advance with over 95% accuracy, uh, which has been terrific for us. Uh, admittedly, yesterday I was just looking at the numbers. Uh, yesterday was an off day. <laughs> um, but by and large, we're pretty darn good. So this is actually being used. For three weeks now, we implemented about three weeks ago, our merch folks are using this to plan. This is the dashboard they use. Again, I'm not a fan of it, but it seems like this is what they want. We could make it a lot prettier, but it gives them the information they need to plan. And the initial feedback we've had has actually been quite positive. So yeah, we're already doing it. Uh, another example that we're working on, general internal medicine early warning system. So this, uh, in the past example, people will say, I think the more intense people will say, oh, Muhammad, that's a cop out. That's not really AI. That kind of is by my definition. Remember I mentioned that at the beginning? So this is more, I think, what people had in mind when they meant AI. So here's the issue. In our internal medicine unit, we have uh, Mr. Jones who comes in. 68-year-old Caucasian male presents with fever, fatigue, body aches, and pains, um, has a bit of a high heart rate, uh, has some lab values done, uh, x-ray, iron studies, and so forth. Then there's the physician. Physician's managing Mr. Jones. Now, the problem he has is he's got to take into consideration family history, medications. The average patient in the internal medicine unit will get 13 different meds. Patient's on a cardiac monitor, has a urine sample, x-rays. <laughs> Uh, he's got over 80 blood tests in a typical internal medicine patient during a given stay. Vitals are being taken all the time, blood pressures, temperatures, all that stuff are coming in all the time. Also, we've got all the infectious disease specialists because of the fever, and we have a cardiologist uh, seeing him as well. We've got the physiotherapist taking care of him and the nurse. Are you all guys following me? There's a lot of information coming in, right? And they're all taking notes. There's a lot of valuable information in those notes. And also, the physician's looking after a lot of other patients. That's really tough. Miller's law suggests that the average human can process seven things at the same time before we start falling apart. This is way more than seven things. So what's the problem? The problem is in, in our hospital, and we've seen this is true for other hospitals as well, about one out of 13 patients will be transferred to the ICU or they'll die. 40% of these patients, uh, when we've done our reviews, 40% of them, we kind of could tell you right up front, we don't need anything fancy to tell us, they're not gonna do well. But about 60% of them, we didn't really know. It was, it was kind of a surprise to us. So the number one cause is we're not there all the time. You know, the attending physician, how, how much time do you really spend with a patient on a given day? Not much. Uh, the nurse has a lot of other things to manage. So and what we also know is that if we had enough time, early identification, we have care pathways that we could implement. And there are some studies out there that uh, through early identification, when you implement these early pathways, you can cut mortality uh, between 30 to 50%. But you just need time to react. By the time we realize a person's in trouble, on average, we've got about three hours to react. And that's not enough time. So what if someone or, or something was in the background, constantly pulling in data? So we've set up a uh, recurrent neural net. Uh, and it's live 24-7, uh, it doesn't sleep, it's constantly learning. We've trained it on over 20,000 patients at St. Mike's. Um, and it's uh, able to predict uh, with reasonable accuracy uh, high risk versus low risk in terms of patients crashing. As soon as it uh, signals, it will 
signal the, the pager that will alert the physician and the nurse to go see that patient within two hours because something is wrong. Now, this sounds really neat, and I'm really excited about it, but this is what keeps me up at night. The reason why is because, well, I'll go into it in just a bit. Um, I'm gonna make the argument here that we're not only ready, we're using AI, whether people like it or not. And there will be failures. But how are we gonna learn if we don't try? Uh, and as I mentioned before, over 50% of healthcare decision makers expect widespread adoption within five years. That's the Intel survey. How are we using uh, AI? That's a separate discussion. Again, don't vote on that. <laughs> vote on, are we ready? The issues are, are we developing valid and reliable AI solutions? And I think there's a lot, been a lot of discussion, so I'm told. Having a supportive healthcare environment, and this is, again, we had to go through a massive process at our hospital to engage a lot of different players to make this happen. Effectively implementing, are we doing it well uh, from an implement implementation standpoint? Just to give you a sense, the GIM uh, early warning system that I just mentioned, we've got a team of at least a dozen people representing different areas of the hospital uh, that are involved in the implementation. And there will be costs involved. The hospital has bought into those costs. It will be happening. And of course, continuously assessing performance. That's something I don't think we do nearly as well as we should. And I'm gonna use a case example here. There's a nice study that was published uh, in a fairly obscure journal uh, around a cluster randomized trial. The concept here was febrile urinary tract infection. So febrile UTIs, a person comes in, says I got a pain right around here and I've got a fever. And you think, okay, probably urinary tract infection, they've spiked a fever, my options are one of two things. You send them home on antibiotics or you admit them for further observation. So what these folks did is they created a risk prediction tool and they basically said, I'm gonna help you decide if you should send them home on antibiotics or if you should admit them. And what did they find? Now they randomized, I, thought, I think it was about 35 different centers uh, from seven different hospitals in the Netherlands. And what they found was that in the immediate term, the admission to hospital decreased significantly, which is great, right? Uh, among the arm that was randomized to use the prediction tool. But when they followed people up for the next week or two weeks later, they found the number of people coming back because they had problems increased fourfold in the risk prediction arm. Why? This was supposed to help. It didn't. It hurt our patients. And the reason why is because the implementation issues were actually quite large in this, in this study. So was the risk prediction algorithm uh, in terms of methodological issues. It just wasn't done that well. So there are some learnings here. But again, I'll remind you, the debate is about whether we are prepared for AI. And I'm fully uh, a cognizant that our experiment with the early warning system, I'm not sure how it's gonna do. I think it's gonna do well, I'm hoping it's gonna do well, but we need to find out, and that's why we're doing it. We're gonna have an extensive evaluation period um, to make sure that we'll help, we're helping and not hurting. We need to see more of that. But I would argue we're more than ready, we're embracing it. So the debate here is about whether we are prepared for AI. There will be successes and there will be failures, but this is how we learn and advance the field. The fact that we're even trying means we are embracing AI and therefore, we're ready. At that point, I will end and say thank you. I do wanna say one other thing. It's something that my mom had told me. Never ever trust anyone who comes up to a podium to present who's not wearing a jacket. Thank you. <laughs> No, no, this is great. Um, so, and I'm often the only person in the room without a jacket at these kind of meetings. Um, so, so how many people uh, saw the presentation I gave in the morning? Could you do a raise of hands? All right, so only a few people didn't see it. Okay, so, so I'm gonna change what I say a little bit here. And uh, I've, I've adapted the, the title just, just a minor bit here. You know, surgeons don't let surgeons do surgery in the dark, the importance of illumination in, uh, in machine learning for, for healthcare. Um, I'm going to start and go through some of the slides that you saw this morning, and then I'll talk about some new stuff, and then maybe I'll come back to some of the stuff we did this morning. Uh, but it seems like most people saw the, the presentation this morning, so I don't really need to recap it. Um, wh what I do want to start by saying, though, is two of the systems that I've trained are actually in clinical use or have been in clinical use. So, of course, I think sometimes <laughs> we are ready to use uh, AI machine learning in, in healthcare. 
Um, I guess the, the most accurate statement I would make, and, and I do machine learning for healthcare is the main thing I do. So, so of course I believe uh, it, it's something we, we need to do. I guess I would say, you know, there's sort of machine learning here and there's healthcare here and there's still a gap in between, uh, and it's up to us to sort of bridge that gap safely, efficaciously, so that we don't hurt too many patients in the process uh, of starting to deploy this new technology. Um, so, so, and there are definitely mistakes that the models make, and that's what I'm gonna focus on. Um, so, so as I said this morning, there's an awful lot of people in my field, and you should be, be afraid of these people, who really think that, uh, you know, if they train an accurate enough model, that it's just ready to go. Um, and in healthcare, this is a very risky attitude. So, so it's important to, to have proper respect for the complexity of the field uh, and for the risk that you're putting people through. Um, and you saw examples like this where, you know, the model thinks that's a panda, we add a little nematode to it, and suddenly the model is confident it's a gibbon. Um, these sorts of things where the model actually somehow thinks that's a cheetah, that's a bird, this is a panda, that's a centipede. Um, and this beautiful slide where the model sort of thinks that, that that's the platonic form for electric guitar, for baseball, for starfish, for remote control. I mean, these, these are really remarkable things that the models are learning, but they're still quite different from the way humans work. And that's the fundamental problem, I think, is that machine learning, because it's so different from us, and because we're so unfamiliar with it and the way it behaves, we have a tendency to think, oh, you know, doctors have a 5% error rate and the machine learning system has a 4% error rate, therefore it must be better and safer than the doctors. But it turns out the machine learning system doesn't make the same kinds of errors uh, as we do. And often the accuracy we're reporting for the machine learning system is sort of optimistically good. So, so I made this joke this morning that, you know, machine learning is sort of an idio savant from another planet. It doesn't know how our planet works. Uh, and because of that, some of the things it's gonna do are risky. It's gonna make errors that no human, no doctor would, would ever make. And just because a doctor and a deep neural net have similar accuracy does not mean you should put equal trust into the, into the deep neural net as you might put into a doctor. So let me give you some more examples of this. So, so machine learning, you know, it doesn't know what it shouldn't learn, it doesn't really know what it has learned, and it doesn't know when the world changes. So let me give you some examples of this to use these patterns. So let me give you some examples of these things. Um, there's a, a data set where cow recognition is, you know, one of the object classes that we're trying to recognize. And it turns out it's really good at recognizing cows as long as they're in fields near barns and fences and things like that. But if you suddenly take that same cow and you have it standing on sand next to the water, suddenly it doesn't recognize it as a cow. And that's because the data set didn't include backgrounds that included water and sand for, for the cows. So, so that means the machine learning model is using the background as a very important part of its cow recognition. So I mean, now we don't do that so much, right? I mean, I could take the cow and cut it out and put it on the moon or put it in orbit around a planet, and you would still say, wow, that's weird. It's a, it's a cow orbiting the Earth, right? The machine learning system will not do that. So it does not yet have the smarts to recognize, wow, that's a cow, it's just a cow in a weird place. It, it doesn't do that because it uses the background. And I'll bring this back to, to healthcare in a second. There's also a, a thing in the same data set. It turns out for horse recognition, uh, a lot of the horses came from a database where there was a text box in the lower left or right side left or right side of the images, and those text boxes gave you information about the horse. Um, you know, what races it had won, who the trainer was, what stable it's from, you, you know, history about the horse, that, that sort of thing. And if you do a saliency projection of the machine learning model, it turns out it's more important that it sees a text box in either the lower left or the lower right hand side of the image than it is that it sees a horse. And if you have a horse that doesn't have the text boxes, it's more likely to think it's a donkey or something that's horse-like, but not a horse. And that's because the training data it saw, you know, usually had these text boxes in the data set. So now how does this sort of thing happen in healthcare? Well, in a data set for uh, breast cancer, uh, when a doctor decides that it is likely to be a tumor, often they'll bring up a tool to help measure the size of the tumor. And that's important not only to decide what care you might give now, but it's important for knowing months down the road if the care has been successful, right? 
It turns out in a certain percentage of the images, the ruler is left somewhere in the image. There's some history that this ruler was used. And the ruler is not used, typically, if it's a calcification. It's used if it's a tumor. So the ruler is a really sure sign that the doctor thought that this was a tumor. And I tell you, the neural nets are amazingly good at detecting rulers in the image. And that's because by detecting the rulers, they know the answer with almost perfect confidence. Uh, and that's because they're sort of cheating, right? They're using information that as a human, we wouldn't think we should be using. But some of this superhuman accuracy that we're seeing in machine learning models is actually coming from this sort of side information that shouldn't actually be used for the prediction, but the machine learning models don't know that they shouldn't use it for the prediction because they don't really understand what's going on. There are other situations of this, right? So, so often MRI CT machines will have text that shows up in the edges of the machine, and that'll be different for different machines. So, and different machines in different places are in places where there's different prior probability of diseases. So the neural net will, if possible, it'll learn to recognize the differences in the text that shows up at the edges of your imagery, imagery. And then it'll use that because it correlates with the prior probability as part of its decision making. It might not be the main thing that it's learning, but it's certainly part of what it's learning. And it's part of why the model appears to be very accurate. The things can also learn, like, you know, you had a CT mis machine, and uh, it's uh, an open magnet machine. And then you have a newer machine that's a high performance, high throughput machine. And you have a smaller, older machine that's maybe at a more rural hospital where they haven't updated their machines yet. All of these machines have different statistics in the image. And deep learning is remarkably good at recognizing statistics in, in images. That's what it does. So it's capable of finding out that oh, the machine that seems to have higher background noise comes from a hospital with lower prior probability of the disease, and it will take that into account in its prediction. So again, it'll be using cues that uh, we probably wish the machines were not, were not using, and that doctors would do their best to, to ignore. So the model doesn't, you gotta be careful. You, you might think, uh, you know, somebody mentioned this morning on a panel, well, we really trust the model when it thinks it's really accurate, when its prediction is very, very confident. The model doesn't know when it's right or wrong. And the fact that it has high confidence in its prediction does not actually mean that it's likely to be correct. It, it could easily be that it's using other cues, or as you saw in the work I presented this morning, it's using other features to predict something with high confidence, like the asthmatic who's 101 with chest pain and heart disease, it's predicting that they're low risk. It could be very confident of that prediction, but that doesn't mean the prediction is right. Okay, so, so we have to distinguish between sort of accuracy in the real world and the accuracy or confidence that the model might have. We can't trust the model to know itself. So machine, like every doctor knows what their specialty is. Like a doctor will say, well, I'm not a radiologist, but, you know, you know or I don't do pediatric, um, you, you know, or I work in this, right? right? So, so machine learning models don't really understand this. Um, so, so there's a machine learning model that was trained at a number of hospitals and then was deployed to a very large number of hospitals. Uh, it was a good model. But some of the hospitals it got deployed to were children's hospitals. And it had never been trained at a children's hospital. And of course, it's accuracy at a children's hospital. As, as somebody said at the very beginning of the meeting or maybe at dinner, um, I think maybe you said this. Uh, you, you know, children are not small adults, right? Um, so, 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 um, uh, so the model doesn't know what it knows or doesn't know, right? It didn't recognize that suddenly all the patients it was being applied to were under 18, were shorter, that there was a lot more, you know, leukemia. It, it didn't notice this. The model just sort of kept happily going on and making predictions, even though it had been trained on a very dis different distribution. And I was explaining this once uh, to, a, to a group of people, and somebody raised their hand and they said, oh, it happened to us three weeks ago. So we trained a model in our hospital. Uh, it turns out the model was intended only for adults. We did a very careful rollout in our hospital. We deployed it and it was making terrible errors like we had never seen in the test data. And it took us a, a little while, but after a day or two, we realized it was making all these terrible errors, errors on pediatric cases, which it was never supposed to be applied to. We had forgotten to check the little box that said only adults should get through to this model and, and make a prediction. So, so this kind of mistake can easily happen 
And it's important for us to sort of be in the loop and paying attention to these things, because the models, unfortunately, aren't paying attention to themselves. They, they don't know what their expertise is or, or isn't. There's another case, a famous machine learning researcher talked about this case, where uh, a model that had been trained on MRI machines, uh, at some point they replaced the MRI machine with a new one that had better resolution and lower noise, and suddenly the accuracy of the model went significantly downhill. That is, the model got worse when the machine improved, and that's because the data no longer looked like the data it was trained on. And while humans might have this sort of problem, they would probably be aware that there was a change and that maybe they needed to recalibrate them, themselves. And in fact, the odds are in a case where the machine is uh, more, you know, higher resolution and lower noise, the humans would just be thrilled to, to have the better imagery. Um, uh, Anna was telling me uh, today about a cirrhosis model uh, that they trained that was very accurate here in Toronto. And when they went and tested it at McGill, it turns out the patient distribution at McGill is quite different than the patient distribution here. I think there was a more elderly patient distribution at McGill. And the model had a much different error rate at McGill than it had here at Toronto. But then if they corrected for this different patient distribution, that is they, they got rid of some of the older patients at McGill, on the patient distribution that looked exactly like the patient distribution at Toronto, suddenly the model was very accurate again. So it's another case of sort of distributional shift. And we have to be careful about that with our models. Our models are only good at exactly the kinds of things they were trained on. They don't extrapolate or generalize beyond their training set at, at all. Um, and then we did some stuff with uh, the SAPS-2 model. You guys are fam all familiar, I assume, with the simplified acute, right, the, the ICU uh, uh, physiology score. Um, so we trained a model um, on the MIMIC data, and it basically said that HIV was actually a very low risk factor if you were in the ICU. So it, it, it said subtract many points from risk if you're an HIV patient. And yet the SAPS model, if you look at it, SAPS-2 says add something like 18 points for HIV AIDS patients. And we were wondering about this discrepancy. We were comparing the two models, and a doctor said, oh, it's, it's easy. SAPS was trained on data from around 1990. The MIMIC data is much more recent, 2005. Back in 1990, HIV was a death sentence. 2005, it's now a treatable illness. So this large discrepancy in the model is due to a change in healthcare that's happened over the time. And of course, nobody's updated the SAPS model yet to, to sort of fix that. So it's still making, happily making wrong predictions unless you, you ignore that part of the model. Um, and all of our models are gonna be like that. When we train a model, if the machine changes, if the world changes, if healthcare changes, our models, unless we know to update them, are gonna happily go ahead and, and keep making mistakes on the newer data because they haven't been trained for it. The data always has unexpected problems, and these are the sort of things we saw this morning, and I think probably I should just stop. Um, so let, let me just jump to the end. I'll skip all the stuff we did this morning. Just a door moment, uh, I took Mohammed's mother's uh, observation about the jacket. Oh. So we, we gave you an extra couple can, minutes on the basis great, of that great, premise, great. okay? Can I just but let's wrap. A jacket? So. <laughs> um, so I just want to end with this. So, okay. so and this will be fine. You know, the machine learning model, it didn't go through medical school. It wasn't born, it didn't go through grade school or kindergarten. It doesn't know what a patient is, right? It doesn't understand how healthcare works. And it doesn't know how to respond to change. In fact, it typically doesn't even know that change has occurred. Okay, so, so it doesn't know any of that. Now, sometimes that matters, and sometimes it doesn't. So, so to give you an idea where it does matter, um, oh, oh, I heard a story the other day, you know, Waze, the app that helps you find efficient routes, you know, and now it's in Google Maps and uh, all the other mapping systems have the same sort of thing. You know, if a person who believes they're having heart attack tries to use something like Waze or talk to a human, the human, would immediately route them on the most efficient route. But Waze doesn't actually do that. What Waze does is it randomizes the different routes that you receive to somewhat you know, different, but hopefully all still reasonably efficient routes. And it does that because it's collecting data. 
So it's using you to run experiments in the real world about how efficient different routes are. But a human in this sort of setting would immediately recognize that, no, 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 no. We're not going to collect any data with you, no experiments. We're going to get you to the hospital in the most efficient way. So a human just sort of does these things effortlessly, automatically. They understand that, oh, the reason why that patient's blood pressure is doing this or this is because of a treatment that we just gave the patient. Um, they realize that the patient is higher risk or lower risk because of treatments. They understand that the patient is receiving treatment, that they're in a healthcare process, and that that healthcare process is af affecting the risk. Now, I'm not saying doctors are perfect at this, but they're a lot more robust than the AI systems. And most importantly, they know when to have doubt about what they're doing or about the information they're, they're receiving. So, so we had a thing we're working on a data set for a sudden infant death. Um, and there are, there are babies who are born that have birth weights that are impossible. It just can't be. They're either you know, way too large or they're much so small they couldn't possibly be viable. And it turns out the model just happily goes ahead and makes predictions for these patients without ever stopping and sort of doing what a human doctor. The doctor looked at the graph and just immediately said, oh, no. There can't actually be any patients there. That, that, that's wrong. It must be a coding error in the data. This, this is actually impossible. Or uh, I had a doctor look at another graph and say, well, you know, I like all of this, this graph except for this part. It turns out the patients that would be there have to be dead. Uh, <laughs> so, so their probability of death is either one. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not actually possible for, for patients to, you know, have zero respiration rate, zero heart rate. And, and zero blood pressure. Um, so, so the models sort of don't understand any of this. They don't have the background. They don't have the big picture. They, they don't have the, the sort of conventional um, knowledge that we all have about these sorts of things. And because of that, in a certain number of cases, they will just happily go ahead and make very silly, and unfortunately in healthcare, potentially risky mistakes. And I think it's up to us, uh, both as a technologist and as machine learning practitioners, to take this sort of gap between the machine learning AI developers like me and the practice that many of you do and to sort of bridge this gap in as safe a way as, as possible. So, and I think we're, we're ready to do that, but I think it's a challenge and it's gonna be a long, long challenge. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Rich. Well done. Hold you to five minutes. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Well, well, you just said we're ready. <laughs> I think we're done. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, um, I, I do think the right precautions have to be there. I, I think people will generally agree that we're in an environment now that is hungry for this. Um, we have enough inefficiency, enough problems in healthcare that we need help. And we're looking at all sorts of solutions, including AI. And I do think we're genuinely ready. How we go about it is absolutely a different issue. And um, I, I do think somebody actually told me about this uh, a while ago. It's, it's like thinking about this like you're, you're, you've got a little kid. This little kid, you give him a pair of scissors and you give him some paper and you tell him to go cut that paper. So you got a couple of options. One is you could tell that pa kid to just, who's never seen scissors before, just to go and do it and risk that he's going to be running around this room with scissors in his hands. Or you could say, I'm going to give you a teacher, and they're going to teach you how to cut paper. And then once you've learned, then I'm going to let you cut a, new, a few sheets on your own, and, and then maybe you could go on your own completely. Uh, I think we should be in that second camp, right? I don't think AI is smart enough to go and run with scissors and cut paper on its own. So what does this really mean? Um, I think ML could be helpful, uh, machine learning, AI, however you want to term it, with conditions. In our conditions, at least I can speak from our experience, is you have to have the right team. The right team has to be in place. So what I mean by that is there has to be a learning environment with data scientists, with clinicians, with administrators, with end users who understand the context in which the machine learning is going to be applied. And you have to have people who understand machine learning and data science. The second is the right questions. I. I would guess for every 10 questions that we ask, I'm thinking maybe one or two we might be able to tackle. The rest, just say no. Don't do it. And we have to have that courage to be able to say, not every problem is gonna be able to be addressed by analytics or machine learning. Maybe you don't have the right data. Maybe the data quality isn't so good. 
uh, maybe the questions aren't so good. Um, I'll give you an example. We're looking at things like uh, sensitivity around our early warning system example. When we look at that, we're interested in how many cases it picks up, but we're more interested in what we're calling helpful sensitivity. So is it pick picking up the cases that I would never have guessed, and is it right? Or is it picking up cases that really is no help to me? I could have predicted that without any sort of algorithm. It's helpful sensitivity, uh, and so we're getting at that. And it's incredible that when you have the right team, we have physicians literally reviewing hundreds of charts because they're so passionate about their project. And they're coming up and saying, this is so not helpful because it's telling me things I already know and it's missed a whole bunch of people that I could have said should have, it should have caught it. It's that, that sort of uh, level of engagement that we need. Of course, the right data, uh, that I think everybody would agree to. If you don't have the data there, it can be really, really challenging. And of course, the right process the checks, the balances, the validation. We spend so much time on validating, on cross-validation, on uh, pulling charts, on making sure what we're seeing is right, making sure that the clinicians are getting information and the administrators are getting information that really helps them rather than just creates work and tells them things that they already know. Uh, and those processes have to be in place. So it's not a simple, I got a problem applying machine learning model. It is an entire process and journey that you have to go through to get it right. Now some will argue, people don't have time or energy or money for this, I would argue the gains can be so great that we have to try. Um, and so I just want to make the point that and I think uh, Rich has suggested too, this, this is happening. Uh, you know, I think you've got a few projects that are already going on right now where, where they've implemented. I just think we have to be a bit careful about it. Um, uh, the other point I want to touch on is robustness uh, in terms of uh, AI performing better than humans or vice versa. Um, you know, I'll give you a quick example of, of one thing where we're looking at elective knees and hips. So our group has about, I think, 14 or 15 different projects that we're doing right now. One of them is working with our orthopedic surgeons, and one of the things they're actually um, struggling with a little bit is can we predict which patients are going to stay longer than we had thought and which patients are going to need rehab? because we don't want to struggle last minute to try and arrange for rehab, and then we, the patient stays in the hospital for a few more days while we're trying to get our act together. So if we knew in advance, before the patient even came for their procedure, that would really help us plan. Fortunately for us, we actually had about six months of predictions data from the clinicians, because they had to do it for planning purposes. So we're able to compare clinician predictions with what our model did, and I can say our model beat it by a pretty decent margin. Um, and we tested it again, and we reviewed it with the surgeons, and they got excited. And so this is why there's gonna be adoption because the clinicians can see the value and they want it adopted. So that process has to be there. And uh, so again, I, I'd like to end by saying I think uh, this area is incredibly important. I think it will fundamentally help us. It won't solve every problem that we struggle with, but if we're careful with the right team and the right process, I think it can really transform a lot of the work that we're doing. And the last thing I'd like to say is if you love your mom, vote for the guy in the jacket. <laughs> Thank you. completely agree that the process is a critical part of this. To give you an idea of the process that most machine learning people like me were brought up in, um, we would go to the web, download a dozen different data sets, uh, try our algorithm on it overnight, uh, see if we sort of got higher accuracy than other people had reported before, hopefully on you know eight or 10 of the 12 data sets. And then we would put a table in a paper, declare victory, and sort of go on to the next technique. Um, so for those of you who do machine learning research, you know that this is a very common, <laughs> uh, I, I'm guilty of this, uh, like many people in the field. Um, that's quite different from how I believe we should approach medical machine learning, right? Uh, I think it's very important to spend time with the data, to understand the problem, to understand how the prediction would be used, to better understand what metrics really do matter, um, to understand how you would know if the model is making mistakes on certain classes of patients. These are all things which traditional machine learning education uh, does not teach us technologists to do, but I think is critical in this domain. So, so and this is why I think there should be a certain amount of caution um, when people from my community sort of rush into healthcare, you know, feeling that they can sort of change the world rapidly. Um, I think there is definitely an opportunity and a need 
for this sort of technology in, in healthcare. But I think we need to do it more carefully than we do uh, most of the other research that we're used to doing. Um, one of the big opportunities, of course, is to try to combine, because the errors that, uh, and someone mentioned this on the panel, because the errors that uh, uh, machine learning makes is quite different from the errors that humans make, you really can't imagine combining these two systems together in a way that would give you superhuman, super AI performance. You would get performance that neither of the systems alone could provide. And I, I think that's a great direction to, to go. Um, so as long as there's a sort of safety net, um, you, you know, for both systems when they might make mistakes, that, that's fantastic. Um, and everyone will benefit from that. Uh, I think it's also critical that when we deploy these systems, you know, just like when we deploy a drug or a new procedure, we have tracking after deployment to try to find side effects, things that we didn't anticipate to measure the efficacy of the, the system in the real world. I think we're gonna have to do that with these AI systems as well once we deploy it. We're gonna have to have very good tracking of what the, the systems are doing so that as quickly as possible, uh, the example you gave, as quickly as possible we can recognize whether this is actually helping patients or, or hurting patients. Or maybe it's helping most patients but hurting certain classes of patients, such as patients who have heart disease and chest pain and, and things like we saw in the morning. Um, so finally, I just want to respond to one thing you said that, that uh, has a, been a big concern of mine since we started working on intelligibility, and that's I started uh, work in machine learning and healthcare believing that if I got really good data, most of my problems would go away. That, uh, that it was possible to get really good data and that I could clean that data, prepare that data, and then what machine learning learned would be correct. And now that we have the intelligible models, these sort of glasses which let us see what these things are learning, we realize that even with perfect data, there are some problems that are not gonna go away, uh, at least not in the short term. And that's because the data includes all the effects of the interventions that are currently being applied to the patient. And yet, for the most part, the machine learning models are incapable of taking that into account. So something a human would easily do uh, would be to compensate for treatment that a patient receives when, when trying to predict risk. But the machine learning models don't do that. They just sort of predict, oh, that patient's sort of intrinsically low risk. And then if the model is used to intervene in a patient's health care, it could be very, very inappropriate um, because it actually predicts that the highest risk patients are now low risk. Uh, so it's not the case that we can always collect data that will make these problems go away it's very important that we have some sort of intelligibility, some way of checking the model after the fact so that we can see what it learned from the data. Because as I showed this morning, much of what the models learn is truly wonderful and, and useful and correct. But there's some percentage of what is learned from most data sets that is actually risky and needs to be sort of recognized as being inappropriate for the use the model will be put to. And, and 